Good morning and welcome to the next installment of OEFC in Exile. We're still in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 23, and we're going to have verse, the reading from verse 23 through to the end of chapter 24. And our brother, Martin Holman, is going to do the reading for us. So over to Martin. Acts chapter 23, verse 23. Then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, Get ready a detachment of two hundred soldiers, seventy horsemen, and two hundred spearmen to go to Caesarea at nine tonight. Provide mounts for Paul, so he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. He wrote a letter as follows. Claudius Lysias, to his excellency, Governor Felix, Greetings. This man was seized by the Jews, and they were about to kill him. But I came with my troops and rescued him, for I had learned that he is a Roman citizen. I wanted to know why they were accusing him, so I brought him to their Sanhedrin. I found that the accusation had to do with questions about their law, but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. When I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case against him. So the soldiers, carrying out their orders, took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as Antipatris. The next day they let the cavalry go on with him while they returned to the barracks. When the cavalry arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. The governor read the letter and asked what province he was from. Learning he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. Then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace. Chapter 24 Five days later the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus, and they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. When Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. But in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect, and even tried to desecrate the temple. So we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about all these charges we are bringing against him. The Jews joined in the accusation, asserting that these things were true. When the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you have been judge over this nation, so I gladly make my defence. You can easily verify that no more than twelve days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple, or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets, and I have the same hope in God as these men, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings. I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring any charges if they have anything against me. Or those that are here should state what crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin. Unless it was this one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence. It is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. 
Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias the commander comes, he said, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewess. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul discoursed on righteousness, self-control and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, That's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe, so he sent for him frequently and talked with him. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Paulcius Festus, but because Felix wanted to grant a favour to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. That's the word of God. Thank you. In 1981, 23 IRA prisoners in the Mays prison, just outside Belfast, went on hunger strike. They were demanding the right to be treated as political prisoners rather than as criminal prisoners. By the time the hunger strike was broken, 10 of the prisoners had died, including Bobby Sands, who famously in the course of the strike had been, hunger strike had been elected to the House of Commons. Last week, we read of a hunger strike that a group of over 40 Jews went on in their bitter opposition to the ministry of Paul. They had vowed to neither eat nor drink until they had killed the apostle. But as we saw last week, the providence of God was very much in evidence. And the Lord Jesus appeared to Paul in his prison cell, and it was revealed to him that he would not die as a martyr in Jerusalem, but would go on to preach the gospel in Rome. Paul's enemies, therefore, had signed their own death warrant unless they broke their fast. They were powerless against the forces of providence. Paul's nephew gets wind of the conspiracy on his uncle's life. It's reported to the Roman commander who gives Paul the level of security an American president is used to. And Paul is transferred under heavy guard to Caesarea, about 16 miles northwest of Jerusalem, for his case to be heard by the Roman governor of Judea. In five consecutive chapters of Acts, Paul undergoes five trials. In chapter 22, he goes before the court of public opinion and the crowd calls for him to be stunned. In chapter 23, he appears before the Jewish religious council and a theological war breaks out between the Pharisees and Sadducees. For his own safety, Paul is taken back into Roman custody. And in today's passage, in chapter 24, Paul appears before the justice seat of the Roman state. And like any gripping courtroom drama, there is a twist. In the course of the passage, the roles are reversed. The defendant becomes the prosecutor and the judge becomes the defendant. But this story from Acts is more than a, a riveting tale. Using the Roman governor as a case study, it reveals something very important about conviction of sin and the window of opportunity for salvation. I would like us to look at Paul's trial, third trial under four headings. It would actually be more accurate to say that the, this trial consisted of two hearings, the first with Paul in the dock and the second with the judge in the dock. Our first heading covers the official hearing in verses 1 to 23 of chapter 24. I've called it the, the theatre. Courtrooms make for good settings for films, plays, radio and television series. A few years ago, The Archers was enjoying abnormally high listening figures. The trial of Helen Titchener for the attempted murder of her abusive husband, Rob, had gripped the nation with millions of listeners tuning in over a number of weeks. The episode in which the jury gave its verdict was actually expanded to an hour for the first time in the history of the Archers. So the cut and th thrust between prosecution and defence 
makes for great source, sources of theatre. And this passage is no exception. Let's look at the, the main protagonists. Well, firstly, we have Ted Tullus, the prosecuting lawyer for the Jewish religious establishment. Someone has said cynically that a, a lawyer will do anything to win a case. Sometimes he will even tell the truth. But that description would fit Tertullus very well. The truth was a, a stranger to him. It was Benjamin Disraeli who once remarked that if you talk to a man about himself, he will listen for hours. It was certainly a, a method Tertullus adopted. One commentator makes the observation that he begins his speech with almost nauseating flattery. He applies the flattery, not with a teaspoon, but with a trowel as he tries to gain the sympathy of the judge. Let me paraphrase the silver-tongued lawyer. Most excellent Felix, we express our profound gratitude. Under you, we've never had it so good. And although you're a busy man, would you just see your way to hear our case? It's pretty toe-curling stuff. Tertullus is the Mr. Smoothly Smooth of the hearing. This opening statement is, is actually a, a total lie. Felix had a, a reputation for brutality as governor among the Jews. He would put down Jewish unrest ruthlessly. So he wasn't loved by the Jews, he was hated. But then Tertullus presents falsehoods as evidence to incriminate Paul. The charges he makes against the apostle are, are threefold. Firstly, from verse 5 in chapter 24, he can, maintains that Paul is a seditionist, seditionist, that he causes trouble wherever he goes. He is a cause of disorder, something the Roman state was particularly sensitive to and would punish severely. Secondly, this Paul is a, a religious fanatic and uh, of a, an off-the-wall sect following a self-proclaimed prophet from Nazareth. Thirdly, he's, he's defiled the temple area, sacred to Jews by bringing an uncircumcised Gentile into it. So that was Tertullus, whose stock in trade was sycophancy and lies. But next we have Governor Felix, the judge. His was a, a rags to riches story. Born into slavery, he is the only slave ever to have gained his freedom and to have risen to the rank of governor of a Roman province. You might say that was quite an achievement. But the Roman historian Tacitus, who was born just uh, before these events took place, paints a far less appealing picture of Felix. He described him as a master of cruelty and lust who exercised the powers of a king with the spirit of a slave. In other words, he'd got to the top of the greasy pole and he was determined to stay there and would come down ruthlessly on anyone who tried to loosen his grip on power. So Felix was no touchy-feely politician. Although he had had the humblest of backgrounds, he had no particular empathy for the underdog. He knew that money talked and would exploit the power of his position by accepting bribes. That was Felix unscrupulous, unsympathetic, and unprincipled. He was no fool, and he could see through the wiles of a sycophantic lawyer trying to ingratiate himself with the judge. So he gives the defendant, Paul, his chance to speak. So we come to Paul, the apostle. Now, Paul had given his apologia of his Christian faith before the crowd in Jerusalem in chapter 22. Now in verse 10, he begins his defense, his apologia, against the charges leveled at him. And his defense is twofold. Firstly, he's guilty of nothing more than being a Christian, a follower of the way, verse 14. In fact, his beliefs overlap to a large extent with those of his accusers, in that he also believes in the resurrection of all men, verse 15, to face judgment. Secondly, as for being a revolutionary, nothing could be further from the truth. He had always tried to keep a clear conscience, not just before God, but also before the state, verse 16. 
Therefore, the accusations against him were criminal in nature. Were not criminal in nature, rather, but theological. They really didn't concern a Roman court of law. After hearing Paul's defense, Felix adjourns the formal meeting. But there is something about the plucky apostle that intrigues him. And in verse 24, a second informal hearing takes place a few days later. Felix grants Paul an audience with himself and his wife, Drusilla. She is Jewish, the daughter of King Herod Agrippa I, the Herod who had had the Apostle James beheaded and the Apostle Peter imprisoned in Acts 12. It should be added that she was not Felix's first wife or him her first husband. Although still perhaps only in her early 20s, she had already been married to another man, but had been seduced by Felix to become his third wife. It's likely then that Drusilla is the source of the information the Roman governor had gleaned about Christianity. Verse 24 tells us that he was well informed about the Christian faith, but he wanted to find out more. Although he was a, a man who was open to bribery, he realized Paul had something money couldn't buy. So he gives Paul, secondly, the opportunity to present the truth, verses 24 and 25. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. Phoenix, the judge, gives Paul, the defendant, the chance to make his case for the gospel. And Paul did not look a gift horse in the mouth. It was a evangelist dream scenario and he seized it with both hands but he did not give a slick sales pitch for christianity no he explained who jesus was he was the messiah the sacred jewish writings had foretold his atoning death for sin had been foreshadowed in the passover and was totally consistent with the old testament principle that without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sin Furthermore, Jesus did not just die on a Roman cross in the place of sinners. He was raised again to life bodily to demonstrate beyond dispute that sinners were declared righteous in God's sight. Paul did not seem to worry, as so many modern Christians do, about putting people off by talking about sin and human responsibility. Sin is not an abstract concept. It's very real. It's not man who gets to distinguish between what is sinful behavior and what is lifestyle choice. No, that's God's prerogative. And he's given his moral law in his word, the Bible. And he has additionally written his law on men's hearts by making men and women moral beings. John Stott makes this very helpful point. The human spirit protests against reductionism that a man is no more than a computer programmed to perform and respond, or an animal at the mercy of his instincts. Rather, the dignity of mankind is that human beings are free to make choices and are responsible for the choices they make. So Paul goes on that for those who have faith in Christ Jesus as their savior, it cannot be business as usual. They cannot just yield as they once did to the sinful nature within them. No, it means putting it to death. It means repentance. It means a change in direction. It means embracing holiness of life. It means exercising self-control over sinful urges and desires. It means an awareness of a man's accountability before the holy God who cannot look upon sin. It means accepting the fitness of God's judgment. If an opinion poll organization sent a researcher out into the street with the question, what's wrong with the world today? Many, I suspect, would reply, it's those other people who behave badly and who don't live by the rules. That's what's wrong with the world today. They seldom point the finger of blame at themselves. It's always someone else, the lawless minority rather than the lawful majority. And it is inbuilt into human nature to pass on responsibility, even from a very young age. 
This last week, our grandson, who is nearly three, stayed a few nights with us. Early one bitterly cold morning, we found we had a visitor in the bed. Our grandson is always lively and never still. Don't kick granny, my wife complained. It's not my fault, came back our grandson's answer. Whose fault is it then, she asked. Grandpa's was his perfectly serious reply. So when Paul did not soft pedal the truth or water down God's demand for holiness, something thirdly begins to break out within the Roman governor's heart. Look at the first part of verse 25. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid. What comes over Felix? Well, a fit of trembling. Verse 25, Felix trembled. Felix was alarmed. Felix was terrified, as the Amplified New Testament puts it. The roles had been reversed. Paul, the defendant, had become the prosecutor. Felix, the judge, had become the accused. Instead of Paul standing in the dock, it was now Felix. And it was a far from comfortable experience. Even this hardened man, who thought nothing of sending men to their death by crucifixion, had a conscience. God's moral law was written on his heart too. Conscience, in the words of Shakespeare's Hamlet, had made a coward of Felix too. And he trembled before Paul's forensic preaching. When he heard about God's judgment, he shook with fear. His mind went to the things he had done in his life. The deeds he thought no one would ever know about. The people he had used. The lies he had told the lives he had harmed, the victims he had trampled over, the bribes he had accepted, the wives he had discarded. Like King Belshazzar, six centuries before him in Babylon, his face turned pale and his legs became weak as he too realized his life had been weighed on the scales and had been found wanting. Felix had been pronounced guilty in God's court and there was no escape from God's judgment except through Christ. Felix had been convicted of his sin. He knew he was accountable in God's sight. He knew he needed the forgiveness that only came through faith in Jesus. On one level, he wanted that cleansing, but he wanted it on his own terms. He could not countenance the holiness of life God demanded of his people. He loved his sins more than he feared their consequences. His conscience was stirred, it condemned him, but not sufficiently to turn his back on his life of sin and receive Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord. So this leads us fourthly to the tragedy. Look at the second half of verse 25. That's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. Felix fobs Paul off. When he said one of these days, he really meant none of these days. His heart had momentarily been softened, but then like quick setting cement, it hardens. It does not yield. Felix, having glimpsed the light, prefers to live in darkness. The moment of conviction had passed. The appointment had been missed. The opportunity had been passed over. It was almost the prodigal son in reverse. In Luke 15, the prodigal, starving, reduced to grazing pigs for a living, comes to his senses and resolves to return to his estranged father and ask for forgiveness. But when Felix's senses reassert themselves, they lead him back to his life of sin. He'd been born into poverty. He'd had nothing, not even his own freedom to make his own way in life. And then life had taken a turn for the better. He'd become a free man. He had gained promotion, he had gained position, he had gained power. And he had no intention of compromising any of these hard gain advantages by submitting to Jesus Christ as his Lord. He wanted to stay the way he was and to hold on to what he had. He would not allow himself to be disturbed by dark thoughts of guilt and future judgment. So with a, a wave of Felix's hand, Paul is cut off in mid-sentence as he preaches some unpalatable truths. He's dismissed and taken back to his cell. And that 
was Felix's tragedy. In the theater of the Roman court of law, Felix had had a sighting of the Lord Jesus Christ through the living faith of his servant, Paul the apostle. Paul, whose life was on the line, really possessed a hope that transcended his present circumstances. And it intrigued Felix, and he was curious to find out more. And he'd had the privilege of hearing the greatest Christian mind of the early church share the truth about faith in Christ Jesus. He had trembled as he had come under conviction of sin. But as he experienced the fear of God, Paul also held out to him the hope of the gospel. For sin such as yours, Felix, the wrath of God is coming. But for sinners such as you, Jesus died and rose again. It was tragic. He had trembled. He had come face to face with the reality of his sin before a holy God. His trembling offered him the way out of his own prison. He was a prisoner to the wrath of God. He was a prisoner to his sinful nature. There was no release from this prison, save through the gospel. But he chose to disregard the trembling the spirit induced within through Paul's preaching of the word of God. Conviction came and then it left him again. It was normal service returned to Felix. If he really did mean he would seriously pursue spiritual matters with Paul at a later time, he was fooling himself. It's not that he didn't have further occasions with Paul when they spoke with one another. Verse 26 says that Felix sent for the apostle frequently and they talked. It would be unimaginable to think that Paul talked about the color scheme of his cell. Of course, he would have brought the good news of Jesus Christ to Felix's attention time and time again and his need to believe the gospel and to repent of his sin. But the tragedy was... Although Felix heard the same truth, it no longer brought about that trembling. It no longer produced the fear of God. It didn't lead to conviction of sin. Instead, Felix's real motivation for seeking out Paul was monetary. The corrupt governor hoped Paul would be able to raise funds to offer him a financial inducement to release him. Felix was looking for a bribe and not for grace. Felix talked with Paul often, but only for greed's sake. He trembled only once. Paul repeated what he had said during that first private meeting with Felix, but repetition had dulled the same message's potency. That's why some people can sit in church for years and years and can listen to passionate gospel sermons and yet remain unconverted. The first time they heard the gospel, it moved them, but not sufficiently to the point of repentance. It didn't quite bring them to the point where they mourn their sin. Remarkably, they keep coming to church. They keep hearing the good, same extraordinarily good news, but it is met with indifference. It evokes no great response. They've heard it all before. It induces a yawn rather than a yell of contrition. The same is true for the Christian who has drifted into complacency. The pastor preaches a sermon that is a wake-up call. It grabs the attention, it stirs up the emotions, it elicits good intentions. And then the thought comes to him or her tomorrow. I'll get more serious about my spiritual condition tomorrow. When I retire, when I have more time on my hands, when I'm less busy at work, when the children have flown the nest, when I've got this qualification under my belt. This is the last verse from Edgar Albert Guest's famous poem, Tomorrow. The greatest of workers this man would have been tomorrow. The world would have known him had he ever seen tomorrow. But the fact is he died and he faded from view and all that he left here when living was through was a mountain of things he intended to do tomorrow. Is that you? Are you a tomorrow inquirer about Christianity? Like Felix, you are looking for a more convenient season. This is what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Or are you a tomorrow 
Christian. You will get serious about serving Christ at some unspecified future date. Listen to what Paul writes to the Ephesians. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Avoid the tragedy that was Felix. Acts 24 and Paul's trial before Felix really is a, a dream passage for a preacher. It has everything. It begins with great theater, but ends with tragedy. It's interlaced with the preaching of the truth about Jesus Christ, why he came and why he died. It warns us that although many may tremble at God's words, not all turn to him in repentance. The trembling is temporary, it's short lived. It is dismissed for an unspecified tomorrow that may never arrive. Don't know whether you've seen the film Saving Mr. Banks. It's a story in the early 1960s of the tortured relationship between P.L. Travers and Walt Disney over the making of the family favorite film, Mary Poppins. The Disney Corporation had bought the film rights to the book, but Travers, the author, was very concerned to keep her artistic control over the work. She was horrified that Disney intended to include musical numbers and animated scenes in the film. In 1964, the film premiered to great acclaim, but at the after party, P.L. Travers approached Walt Disney and said urgently to him, we still have a lot of work to do. He simply replied, Pamela, that ship has sailed. We might say that was also true of Felix. The window of opportunity for salvation, the ship of repentance had sailed when he set Paul back to his prison cell without responding to his fear of God. He would hear the truth of the gospel from Paul's lips again, but would never again tremble. His conscience wasn't stirred again, demonstrated by the fact that he was willing to overlook justice by keeping an innocent man in prison to curry favor with the Jews he governed. And after two years, Felix was summoned back to Rome and he disappears from history. You know, our time on this planet is so short. There is no time to procrastinate. As the saying goes, procrastination is the thief of time. To anyone tempted to do a Felix, don't allow it to be the thief of salvation. Amen.